what are some of the things that get hardwired into this separation trauma? Some of the beliefs that come to come to pass. One is one of them is that I have no right to exist. Now I, I hear this from adoptees. You know, they they keep trying to prove they have a, a, a right to exist, or they feel as if they don't, and they try to hide in the woodwork or something. You know, that they they really they shouldn't be making too much of a, of a splash in the world because they don't have a right to exist. Or they do the opposite. You know, there, there are Steve Jobs who does more and more and more and more and gets a thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner computer, you know. I mean, he certainly proved he had a right to exist. And people that get two or three PhDs do that too. But then there are the ones that, that don't know what they want to do with their lives. And that makes it more difficult. And there's a feeling of being unworthy or undeserving sometimes among adoptees, uh, unlovable, and, and having no impact. Now I want to talk about that having no impact because a lot of people complain, well I get lots of emails from, from partners of adoptees that say, what is this roller coaster ride we're on? You know, what's going on? Sometimes everything's fine and then everything blows up and you know, what is this anyway? <coughs> Well, one of the things I've discovered in talking with adoptees and, and with the people they live with is that they don't feel as if they have much of an impact. Okay, why not? Why not? Well, at one time, they probably cried a lot in order to get their, their moms back, their first moms back, and nothing happened. And this is an experience they had, right? And remember what happens when you have an experience? You get a neurological connection to the brain. So the brain says, I'm not important. She doesn't care. I have no impact. And so this is this is this becomes a core belief among a lot of adoptees. They really don't think they do. Now all of us adopted parents know they certainly do have an impact. And birth parents do too, because in a reunion they have a big impact. And of course they had an impact on you. The loss of them, the absence of them has had an impact as well. But one of the things that they feel is that they have no impact. So that's one of the reasons I wrote my second book because, you know, adoptees will say, well, you know, we really feel as if you put words to our experience, that words that we didn't have. And so, but what do we do about it? What do we do about the fact that, you know, we, we act the way we do or we feel the way we do and so forth? And so I wrote my second book. The first part is a little bit more academic and some of adoptees. I tell them they can skip that part and go to part two, where, I mean, it's good to go back to, but it's, I wanted to really explain more about that separation trauma and the neurological consequences of that, uh, of that trauma in that second book. For one thing, I didn't want to write another adoption book, so I tried to get everything I wanted to say in this book. It's about 500 pages long, so um, not that I got everything in it. But. So, so this, this business of having feeling as if you have no impact can answer a lot of people's questions about what is going on here? What are, what are we dealing with? Because it's not as if uh, adoptees will take, now they take responsibility a lot of times for having been separated from their first mothers. Somehow or other that was their fault. Something was wrong with them, something, you know, and so they feel this dis un undeserving kind of thing. But they don't feel as if that has very much of an impact on anybody else, or their behavior has an impact on other people. So one of the things I, I try to convince them of, even if you don't feel as if you have an impact, you need to act as if you do, because the rest of us know you do. And so part of, part of healing is sometimes acting in a way that doesn't feel the same intellectually as it does feeling-wise. You know, the limbic set, the limbic uh, part of the brain and the neocortex do not communicate very well. And you can know something, you know, all those facts and, and that everybody likes. I was talking about how everybody likes all those facts and all that research, you know. But the sense of it, and a lot of psychology is what's, what's going on in the limbic part of the brain. The, the feeling part, the fight or flight, the, the things that, the red flag part, you know, or uh, PTSD. Is, is part of that too, because when you have a vague reminder of that first separation, then you, you really react much more than somebody who hasn't had that kind of, of experience in the first place. So 
getting getting those right and left brains. I mean, this is this is a big thing in, in therapy. This is why just talk therapy. You have to do something. I, I like to use those pulses they use in the EMDR. I don't always use the protocol because they don't have conscious memory of the of the trauma. But I do like to use the pulses because that gets the right and left brain going at the same time. And guys seem to love that. They they say, I wish I could walk around all the time with these things, you know? And I think maybe maybe it's because guys aren't as in touch with their feet with that limbic part, you know, that they they feel more alive when that part is is something that they're dealing with. So um, this is this is the this is one of the things that, that we have to do is to try to make headway when we feel as if this isn't right. You know, there are so many things that that with the doctors I say, just because it feels different doesn't mean it's wrong. Because you know they rely on all those old coping mechanisms. And those coping mechanisms don't work very well in, in mature relationships because you know you're not trusting anybody, you're afraid of intimacy, you want to be in control all the time, and all of those kinds of things that don't work very well in relationships. I'll talk more about that in my in my talk tomorrow because I'm going to be talking more from my second book. But I want to I want to make sure that that we get the idea that many adoptees feel as if somehow or other they don't they don't count very much, even though for all of us, you know, we, we fell in love with them right away and we felt very attached to them. They already have felt that somebody didn't feel attached to them and it's really a scary idea to get too attached to anybody. Now, that doesn't mean that, that, that there can't be help in that area and there certainly can, but I wanna talk a little bit about what explicit memory is. Explic explicit memory is about recall. It's about memory of, it's either about, you know, like episodic memory, things that happen in your life, or it can be about semantic memory, things that you know, like Sacramento is the capital of California, that's kind of recall that, that you need for schoolwork. <laughs> but then you have episodic memory, and episodic memory is that you can remember that last Sunday you went to the park, or a year ago you went to Yosemite, or that kind of thing. And that begins to kick in about um, age two or three. So what are some of the things that happen with, in, in the adopted person when all of these things kind of go awry with, with <coughs> the absence of the, of the first mother? For one thing, and, and you know, as I say, adoptive mothers can do a lot to help their kids if they understand this. You know, there was a lot of, re there's a lot of less resistance now to that because, you know, some of you, I mean, I, I love talking with foster adopt parents because they have the kids in foster care. They know a lot of this stuff because they, they have these kids in foster care and they know that they have these issues. And, um, but sometimes, you know, and, and I was one of those adoptive parents. I mean, I was totally blank when it came to what it would mean to have an adopted child because I just thought, She's three days old, what does she know? Well, she knew that I wasn't that mother she was expecting, for one thing, and she didn't know she could trust me, and you know, it might be too scary to get too close, and as much as I loved her, maybe she, could, maybe she couldn't accept that love right away, and, but did I know that? No, I didn't know that. And, um, and I think that one of the things I think is is wrong about about how they do how they do this. If 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 it's a newborn baby, is that they take the baby away from the mother right away? And I think that's wrong because there's so many things that need to happen between the mother and baby hormonally, and that just doesn't get done. So um, so sometimes those of you who are adopting from foster care, there can be some real advantages to that, although of course all the abuse and neglect and all that is not an advantage and it's something that you have to deal with as well because, you know, that's another trauma. They have had other traumas in their lives. What happens when they don't have the kind of response they need from their mother is something called dysregulation. And dysregulation, I, I think it's really one of the big deals in our country today. I think that probably a lot of the people that are in prisons today have dysregulation. Dysreg they don't know how to self-regulate. 
and they don't know how to self-regulate because they didn't have anybody help them with it in the beginning of their lives. They didn't have that attunement between mother and child where the mother could, could tune into her child's emotions and could soothe that child thousands of times till the child could begin to soothe him or herself. And so, you know, self-organization is, is essential to developing a sense of self, for one thing. And learning to self-regulate is a part of the emotional or, or uh, maturation process. And as I say, it begins with this attunement, with the mother soothing the child, with the child being then able to soothe him or herself. But a lot of adoptees, you will talk to them, when they're in trouble, they want to be all by themselves. They don't want anybody, they don't want to talk to people, they want to go in a closet and, you know, kind of isolate themselves. Well, I think that's because they were isolated in the beginning, you know, and they didn't have anybody understanding what was going on for them. And they, had, they were absolutely helpless to do anything about what was going on for them. And it, it makes it very, it makes it our, our job as mothers of, of any of our children to really be attuned to them as much as we can. And of course today it's easier because those of you who are coming to these kinds of conferences and you're learning about things, and all mothers, you know, those children that are in foster care, obviously a lot of them were there because of neglect. Those mothers were not taking care of their children. They were not tuning into their needs. And so, and, and the ones that come from orphanages or institutions have a lot of sem sen sensory deprivation because they were just left lying there and nobody taking any care of, of their feelings at all. So there's a lot to do. And, and as Adam says, it's, you know, it, it, it's a family, but it is a different family. And if we can, can get that right away, that is very helpful. You know, dealing with the with the um, reality of adoption, that it's not, it isn't like a biological family. It's it's, and it has to be parenting plus. You have you have things to learn as a parent that you wouldn't have to, that you would kind of know about your child if the child was um, biological. Um, now there, there are all kinds of things that make it difficult for adopted parents to know exactly who their kid is. You know. As I said, first of all, there's all the coping behaviors. They cope with, with that loss in various ways. Some of them act out all over the place. Some of them become very clingy. Of course, the ones with the clingy, the parents with the clingy kids think that they're, they're really attached. But you know, attachment is a little bit different from clingy. So, um, but, so some of them, they, they have different coping styles. And the thing is that if one of them has one coping style, the other one will take a different coping style. I mean, I, I found that very fascinating when I was talking to adoptive families. If they had two kids, one of them was the acting out kid and the other one was the, the clingy kid, the, the, the compliant child, the one that was walking the straight and narrow, you know. And I wondered about that and I thought, well, you know, it couldn't be that social workers just managed to get uh, these different personalities into different family, into the same family or something. So, and, and, but I, I had several cases in which Another trauma happened in the family, and the kids just trade places. The coping, the one that was acting out all over the place became very compliant. The compliant kids started acting out. And so this is something you really need to understand. This has nothing to do with their personalities. It has to do with their coping style. And the first one in the family gets to choose, I guess, the coping style. The other one takes the, the one that's left. And then you get kind of a mishmash after that. But it's very important to realize that. Because, okay, so, so this coping behavior that your kids are showing you isn't really who they are. Now, the other thing, the other problem they have is that they're living in a family where they don't see themselves reflected. So not only do they have to cope, but they have to adapt. They have to adapt to the family they're living in. So what does that mean? It means that they are very, very observant. They are watching all the time. They are trying to figure it out every day, how to be in this family. And you know, there are so many ways in which, in which we are like our biological families. It can be communication style. It can be the way you walk, the way you wiggle your ears or whatever, you know, and there are so many ways. It's not just about what you look like. I mean, that's, that's there sometimes, sometimes it isn't. But it's so many ways in which we know things about our families that we don't realize because we're just in the families, you know? So 
And one of the things I noticed when, when I saw my daughter and her birth mom together for the first time, and my daughter was 25 before she met her birth mom, was the mannerisms. They both had similar mannerisms. And I thought, well, that's funny, you know? <laughs> but that's, that's part of all that genetic quality that, that comes with the child that, that we just have to, if we know about it, we can appreciate it more. And I think, and this is the big thing, I think during the teenage years, identity time, that's a big time. It comes out first when the baby's first, if it's an infant, and the baby first knows, so who is this person? This doesn't feel like mom, but then gets more used and used and used to the adoptive mom. But then, when they're teenagers, it comes up again because identity come, comes up, and the child feels so different from the parents. Now, all this time, the child has more or less blamed him or herself for the fact that he or she was given up for adoption and that kind of thing. But then when it comes to teenagers, they kind of blame the parents for everything, everything going on in their lives. And they, the parents don't understand them. They're not like their parents. They feel, you know, they feel kind of a failure because their mother didn't keep them and they feel a failure because they're not quite fitting into the family. And you know, I've, I've heard people in their 20s and 30s, even 40s saying, my mom's still asking me why I'm not like the rest of the family. Why are you not more like the rest of the family? And I said, well, did you tell her because you don't have the same DNA? I mean, it really makes a difference. It really makes a difference. And as I say, we can rejoice in those differences because it can bring out things in the rest of the family that, that maybe hadn't been, you know, there are so many things that you can do and so many qualities that you can have. For instance, uh, there are lots of things that people can do as, as a part of your uh, profession or whatever you want to do in life. But the thing that, that, that you have to know is there are probably four or five things you could be doing. It, it isn't just one thing that, you, that you're going to be good at and you have to find that one thing and that's it. And, and the same thing with, with the way in which we act in the world, you know, of course of course, what happens in our adoptive families and the adoptive family influences the child. But we can't forget that part about the DNA. We can't part, you know, we're always talking about nature versus nurture. And I remember that when we adopted, it was all about nurture. All about how you reared the kids and how much you love the kids and so on and so forth. And, um, and I, you know, I believed that at first, but then I got the idea, uh, I think, pretty quickly that there are other, other things as well. So you have, the coping child, the adaptive child. So where's the genetic child in all of that? Where is that authentic person? It's very hard for adoptees to really find that authentic person until they're kind of moved away from their adoptive families. Because even though their parents can say to them, I want you to be whoever you are, they don't quite believe it. They don't quite believe it. And they keep trying to adapt and trying to fit in. And so until they, they get outside the family somewhat, that is when they can begin to um, explore that. Except, you know, I, I used to do this, <coughs> this um, workshop called, Who, Are, Who Am I? And I'd ask a dog, geez, okay, how many of you go into a restaurant and order first? And they all kind of giggle and you know. I mean, of course some of them could do that. But they know what I was talking about. There's this kind of thing in which you you learn so much in your adoptive family to observe and adapt, observe and adapt. That that's what they kind of do wherever they go, and they call themselves chameleons. But they're kind of chameleons because they keep changing with whatever group they're in, whatever whatever seems to be the right thing to do or say. That's what they do. And so I would ask them questions like, "Oh, what's your favorite color?" Oh, kind of glancing around. I said, well, I, I don't want you to tell me what your neighbor's favorite color is. I want you to tell me what your favorite color is. And at first I thought, well, there was just a, somehow afraid to speak up because maybe maybe it was a wrong answer. You know, what could be the wrong answer, right? Maybe it was the wrong answer. I said, no, we don't know. It's not that we are afraid to say we don't know because for so long they have not given themselves permission to have their own answers from within themselves. And this is, this is part of becoming more mature, becoming more yourself, becoming more authentic. 